Erica, Mallory Blythe, Erica. <coughs> Good afternoon. It's an honour to be here amongst so many prestigious colleagues and, and so in the audience also. Um, I'm here today to talk about the management and diagnosis of EHS, which is a huge topic, um, and we're squashing it into a very small space of time. If we have time at the end of that, I'm going to briefly describe a bit of my own research here in this country also. Uh, I'm a trustee for the Radiation Res Research Trust here in the UK, a board member for the CPTF here an American based group and a medical advisor for ES UK as Michael mentioned in the talk before. This uh, Latin phrase, first do no harm, is something that will be familiar to all of the medical doctors in the audience. I think sadly this fundamentally of utmost importance principle is starting to get lost a little in modern day medicine but particularly when we look at EHS and at the moment in terms of my role for ESUK I've been referred patients who for example um, have been sectioned under the Mental Health Act purely because of their belief that EMF fields have adversely affected their health. This is extremely concerning and whilst it's not common I think there's a huge host of effects um, even just down to disregard um, or disbelief of their symptoms that needs to change. Hopefully today is a very important first step in that direction. We're going to move through the first few slides really quickly because they, they bring in so much of uh, the good work that's already been done this morning by my colleagues. Um, so we'll whiz through, but a fundamental principle of this talk is that electromagnetic hypersensitivity is a physiological condition, not a psychological one. I think this morning's lectures have really made that very clear and there's some excellent mechanisms that we're now finding that explain that process. But if anyone wants to discuss that further with me afterwards, I'm certainly very happy to. Tesla's, uh, Nikola Tesla's already been mentioned, and in your handouts I've put a small excerpt from a biography that was written about him by one of his closest friends, um, O'Neill. And I'd really like you to take the time to read that after in your own time, because it's a really beautiful, elegant summary of how EHS feels to the individual who is sensing it. And this, he describes this upregulation of his entire sensory system and that's integral on a clinical level and I'm here really to talk more about the clinical aspects of EHS that concept's really important and is what happened to Tesla does it make sense all those many years ago absolutely it does and he was he probably had some understanding of that even back then um, normal physiology uh, shows us to be these wonderful antennas I think it was the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy described us as big ugly bags of mostly water. But it's sadly apt and we're extremely good conductors from a DNA level where DNA is a fractal antenna up to the full body organism. And the ECG and the EEG are beautiful examples of this communication process that we can see the electrical, intrinsic electrical nature of the body. This is Professor Henshaw's slide from earlier, but of course we're not alone in those um, am amazing abilities. And in some, this, these senses are highly adapted. And we know that our, it, it would be foolish almost to think that those senses do not exist also in, in humans. So there are a couple of different ways of really looking at EHS. Is it a sickness or is it a super sense? Now, I'm here in my capacity today as a doctor, and there's many doctors in the audience, and we like to fix things. So I'm very much going to dwell on, on the upper aspect here. Um, but I've seen very coherent individuals argue on both sides of this beautifully, and my personal opinion is that it is both, very much at the same time, and it depends on the environment of the individual or the organism as to which one is most strongly exhibited. Um, We've talked about cellular pathophysiology. Um, thank you so much to Professor Martin Paul for what I think is a very, very important underlying aspect of this condition. But there's a really long list of cellular effects, and this is just some of them. Unsurprisingly, all these cellular effects, we've looked at the comet assay and seen the evidence of DNA damage, but unsurprisingly, um, these, these lead on to, to other um, systemic pathophysiological problems. This is a, a test which um, 
it's looking at red blood cells. So on your far left-hand side there, you see healthy red blood cells that should be mutually repellent or floating around disorganized fashion. Um, in the middle, that's 10 minutes on a cordless phone and then 70 minutes at a computer with Wi-Fi. And you can see this, what we call rouleau formation, which is known to be, to be associated with pathological processes. And this is somewhat criticized because some say it's not reproducible or it's subject to some bias. And I take that on board. I think there's fair criticism of it. But that being given, I went off and had a go at this test myself. Um, and I, I found that with just five minutes in Wi-Fi, you could s start to see the formation of Rouleau cells there. Um, now, we talked about things at a cellular level, and this, this is in the general population. I'd like to emphasize that. Those things add up to systemic path pathophysiology that is somewhat predictable, and this is just a handful of effects, let me say that. We don't have time to dwell on them, so I'm going to run through really quickly just some of them. But I think these are important in EHS also. This nervous system drive of the sympathetic or your fight, fight and flight nervous system. This is being pushed as if um, the body is recognizing a hostile threat in the same way that we see with chemical triggers. You can only really be in, in one of two states at a time, primarily sympathetic or parasympathetic. And the parasympathetic, the rest and digest, is what heals you and repairs your system and um, bolsters your immuno immunological function, etc. So Obviously, over a long period of time, if you're pushing this fight and flight system, the energy has to be taken from somewhere else to pay for that energy usage, and it's taken from your healing and resting and repairing phase and growth. So that's a very important effect. Reduced melatonin production, we've touched on this a lot, so I won't go into it, but both of those two things have an effect on your immunological function, and if that weren't enough, there's some uh, apparent direct immune suppression in the form of um, decreased natural killer cells and other types of white blood cells that are important. Reproductive impairment, there's huge literature on this now. Breakdown of the blood-brain barrier, I think, is also extremely important, and this may be also important when looking at autism and Alzheimer's. Um, I've got a slide to show you that in a second. Increased brain glucose metabolism we don't need to talk about, but um, Alzheimer's disease is sometimes known as uh, diabetes of the brain, and I'll show you a slide that shows a link between cell phone use and, and Alzheimer's. Um, oxidative stress and chronic inflammation, again, this links into Martin Paul's work and I think is also extremely important in the maintenance of EHS. And if all that weren't enough, it inhibits some of the repair mechanisms. So there's these sequential mechanisms of damage and then less repair to fix that damage. This shows albumin leakage into the brain of a rat that's been exposed to about two hours of cell phone radiation. All of the brown staining should not be there. That's where albumin has leaked through the capillaries into the brain, brain tissue. Um, this is the in increased brain, brain glucose metabolism that I'm talked about, and Alzheimer's is really becoming epidemic, along with many other medical conditions linked with EMF exposure. We've talked about oxidative stress, but this is just to show you the multi-systemic nature of this, that it affects all the organs in the body, as does EHS. So, unsurprisingly, there's this very long list of medical conditions that have now been associated with EMF exposure in the literature. And this is a slide that just reinforces this concept that we're seeing the same constellation of symptoms over and over again in the general population in a dose response fashion to microwave type EMF fields. So if we're seeing these symptoms in the general population, then it's no surprise that given the increase in ambient fields, EHS figures are rising. This graph extrapolated would tell us that if figures continue to rise at the current rate, then about 50% of the population will complain of EHS by 2017. This could actually be a gross underestimation, given that the points on this graph are people who have made that association. They're people who have thought about the connection between their symptoms and field triggers. The majority of people probably haven't and may have mild symptoms of EHS where they will not be recorded on this graph because they haven't associated them with the MF exposure exposure. Um, etiology is not part of my remit today, so we're going to go extremely fast through it, but it, it, just to summarize really, there may be a predisposition. Certain individuals are bound to be more vulnerable, and there's lots of good reasons for that. But then there's usually a trigger, um, a higher than average chemical or EMF exposure. EMF exposure is more important, it seems, in terms of the development of EHS specifically. And then maintenance of a sort of uh, destructive cycle with positive feedback. And we don't have time to go into these in detail, but they're all in your notes.
Um, so please do take the time to have a look through that. Um, Michael's given us a beautiful uh, synopsis of, of VHS symptoms, which are numerous, far too numerous, and this is a small number of them. But the reason I've included them again is I've put some asterisks in there. We're going to move on to clinical medicine now, and this is very much for doctors. Um, the asterisks are, are by symptoms that I think are slightly hallmark of VHS because they're more unusual than some of the other symptoms. Um, and very quickly as an aside, because my background is emergency trauma medicine, um, I've got to mention that there are some features of VHS which need emergency management. And um, headaches with unusual features, red flag symptoms like early morning wakening or postural symptoms, things that you would be concerned about, brain tumours, it appears brain tumours are linked to EMF exposure and so is EHS. So are people with EHS more at risk? I don't know the answer to that. We don't. These are the kinds of studies that need funding. But MRI is very contentious um, and, and a difficult one when it comes to people with EHS. If it's indicated because you're concerned somebody has a brain tumour, then I think it's very important that it's done. But MRI can be modified in a number of ways that make it far more acceptable to somebody who is likely to be triggered by that kind of radiation. And that's something, feel free to ask me questions about at the end. Pleuritic chest pain, I showed you that slide with rouleau formation. Um, if that is a genuine effect, um, I see a lot of pleuritic chest pain in people with EHS. And that could be small pulmonary emboli. The, the lung acts as a filter, part of that is physiological, but if that happens, um, it obviously potentially needs acute emergency management, as do the others, they're fairly obvious really. In terms of the history, and I think history, I'm going to stop here for a little bit, because history is still, in my opinion, the most important diagnostic tool we have right now. I've mentioned some of the symptoms, but um, particularly if they're triggered in certain locations or by certain devices, weather, moon cycle, these are really big clues, and particularly if when the source is removed, the symptoms go away. It's not rocket science. Um, but please do note in your first history the onset and offset of the symptoms, how often they occur, and the distance for certain, from certain devices, etc. The reason for this is that it's a really nice way of monitoring progress. Body hotspots, this is an unusual phenomenon that is very unique to EHS, but people may say that their right temple hurts, um, specifically with a, a cell phone, and then becomes hypersensitive to other forms of radiation further away, but specifically their right temple. Or they might say their right hand, because they often use it on a mouse, etc. There are local areas of the body that become hypersensitive, a bit like sunburned skin is after it's been burned. This may be to do again with the nitric oxide feedback cycle, which can happen at a very local level. Um, multiple sensory upregulation we've talked about. They may complain a very strong a sense of smell, taste, and eyesight may be very sensitive, especially to UV light. Um, we've talked about sympathetic overactivity, but if that goes on chronically, that can lead to burnout and adrenal insufficiency. And dysautonomia is very common. Chemical sensitivity history we've again talked about. Unusual relief with bathing, which is a great way of grounding. If somebody says, I never get symptoms in the bath or in the shower, that is an absolute hallmark sign of EHS. Pitfalls. This is massively important and goes back to my very first slide, do no further harm. Um, because it's a multi-systemic condition, which is exactly what we would expect for a radiation-induced illness, People can come with a whole host of symptoms, and that can be very overwhelming for the doctor involved, especially if they're not familiar with EHS. And sometimes that will then be put down to psychological manifestations inappropriately. Weak field triggers. They may complain that they can feel aeroplanes, which are obviously a very long way away. Of course that's possible. Aeroplanes have ground, uh, air to ground radar. It's designed to be picked up on the ground. But they may also say torch batteries or anything with battery powers near to their bed space will affect their sleeping. They are correct in saying that this is a possible reaction. Please don't be off put by some of the unusual nature of this phenomenon. They may also say that they interact or interfere with devices, that things malfunction or switch off when they're around them. Professor Henshaw, <laughs> we'll examine you later. Um, it, there are good explanations for that. Um, people, again, can find that very surprising or confusing. There are good physiological explanations for that, and it's, it's probably uh, happening. Um, unusual relief, in fact, I've talked about bathing and grounding, but um, emotional exacerbation. Given that some of the symptoms are sympathetic fight or flight nervous system induced, it's no surprise that they may say if they're angry or upset, their symptoms get worse. That is not because their symptoms are psychologically induced. It's because they're reactivating, they're pushing their sympathetic nervous system even harder. Um, psychiatric manifestations, um, delusional behavior or psychotic um, patterns, <laughs> 
can be seen in patients, ex especially with extreme unmanaged EHS. But in my opinion, the treatment for those should start with classical treatment for EHS, and we'll move on to that as quickly as I can. Not necessarily classical psychiatric management with, for example, pharmacology. Um, unusual beliefs and paranoia, I can't dwell on this much as I'd love to, but in the world that we live in, at a very unique point in time, there's political and socioeconomic pressures that very rightly induce a number of people, not just people with EHS, to feel paranoid or um, have some unusual beliefs about the situation they're in. That is not necessarily a psychiatric diagnosis, and their concerns should be taken seriously. Blood testing principles, we'll move on. Um, there are thousands of blood tests potentially that have use in EHS, and they need to be tailored to the individual person and what their symptoms are. Broadly speaking, these are the different categories that it's sensible to test within because you're looking at their immunological status, their mineral and antioxidant level, all the things that we know could make them more vulnerable or could be an effect of this um, positive feedback cycle that you can end up in. Sympathetic nervous system, we've talked about inflammatory status, mitochondrial and ACP status, particularly in those who've burnt out and have some chronic fatigue site type symptoms. Um, Differential diagnostic screening, of course, is always important, as is comorbidity screening for other things that are having, happening concurrently or they may be at increased risk of because of their EHS. You have a long list of these in your notes, so we, we won't dwell on them, but feel free again to ask me questions. The lymphocyte sensitivity test, I'm guessing John McLaren Howard would, will talk about in his lecture, um, but this is felt at present, although it's a research tool, it hasn't been validated and it's not within use in the NHS. Despite that, it is being felt by those using it to be a diagnostic test potentially for EHS, which also may give an indication of severity. So huge it, it promise there that needs funding for research. Um, all of these others are looking at various aspects such as underlying toxicity um, or uh, sympathetic nervous system activation. Autonomic nervous system testing may be useful for monitoring progress or looking for other toxic overload underlying. The cerebral perfusion Doppler, pulsed echo Doppler, is being used currently by Professor Belpom in Paris. He's noticed left limbic reduction in blood flow in people with EHS. And spec scanning in the States with uh, Dr. William Ray, I know that he's noted salt and pepper type perfusion um, and neuronal activity deficits that look almost like um, pe pesticide poisoning. Um, venous blood te test, uh, gas testing can look for underlying chemical sensitivity particularly. Um, us trauma physicians uh, like life to be simple and we like mnemonics, our ABCs, so I've come up with something very simple um, for both people with EHS and those treating them to follow a very simple set of early management guidelines. This is not complicated, it's easy, so I'm going to go through very fast. Um, but A is for avoidance, and I have to reiterate what's already been said. This is the most important aspect, aspect of management, and there is no substitute for it. None of the other things will work as rapidly or as quickly as avoidance. It's safe, it's usually can be inexpensive, um, and it must be done to the best of your ability. Uh, and I don't mean just EMF. Uh, it's sensible to also avoid toxins and anything that will upregulate the nitric oxide cycle. We'll move on to that. Um, and then the others, we're going to go through one by one, so we'll move on. I've given you a list of things, really easy things to remove to improve health in terms of avoidance. And a very quick note on shielding. Other people will talk about this after me who are far more knowledgeable. All I will say is have some caution. Um, it is better, for example, to shield the device rather than yourself if you can. Know what kind of fields you're shielding against and get expert advice. Use meters before and after because you can find that shielding fabrics actually unusually increase the fields in your environment rather than decrease them. Um, so it really is important to check. Um, we've talked about upregulation of the no oh no cycle, so I won't dwell on that. Um, breathing fresh air, so B we're, we've moved on to. I mentioned this because uh, this came up earlier, the positive ion air ionization. Um, modern AC and heating systems and pollution all create positive ions, which when you look at, uh, and so do some geological formations, of course, um, particularly the desert winds, and when you look at symptomatology of the normal population exposed to these very high positive ion particles, they have exactly the same, unsurprisingly, exactly the same symptoms as EHS. And those can be reversed by breathing negative ion-rich air. <coughs> 
These are generated, the cheap way to get these is to go outside into green areas. It's water droplet formation and uh, that you'd find around mountain springs, etc. I would urge some caution about the negative ion generators, but we don't have time to discuss that in depth. C is for, and creative should probably be on here, creative cognitive care. Um, this must not be underestimated. I've talked about sympathetic upregulation and the fact that emotional triggers will physically make symptoms worse on a cellular level. Um, and I have to mention here cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT. Cognitive behavioral therapy has been found by some to help in EHS. This is not surprising because, as I mentioned, if you're downregulating your sympathetic nervous system with emotional control, that is bound to have a positive effect, exactly as it would in a whole host of other physiological illnesses. However, those who describe EHS using the nocebo effect have sometimes advocated CBT to allay people's fears of using devices such as mobile phones and Wi-Fi routers. That I would caution against massively. I think that is unethical and dangerous at this point in time. We don't have evidence that that kind of use of devices is safe in the general population, let alone for those with EHS. So CBT should certainly be used, I think it's a, a fantastic form of management, for almost all medical conditions because um, mind and body interact. We know that, that's age old, um, but it, it must be used carefully for the right reasons, not to allay fear of triggers that have led to their uh, condition. This is an advice sheet which is available um, through the BSEM afterwards just for patients with EHS and their practitioners. Dental care, I won't spend long on this, but a removal of mercury amalgams, it's um, a little bit contentious. And certainly if they're degraded, I think it makes perfect sense. Um, and if you are planning to use uh, DMPS as a chelator, and we'll move on to chelation, you may have no choice but to remove mercury amalgams because of mobilization of mercury. Exercise uh, is generally a good thing. Have caution in patients with chronic fatigue. Um, but you can also combine exercise with many of the other things that are important for optimizing health. Food, Dr. Munro is going to be giving a very in-depth lecture on nutrition in EHS, so I'm not going to stop on there. Grounding, I've mentioned, it makes sense that this is useful. I personally recommend bathing above all else for immediate release, relief in, of symptoms in some cases. And there are other products designed to help people ground when they're walking. Just beware that you're not walking on terrain that's actually energized or that will be non-protective. Hydration is important, again, for everyone, but it may be particularly important in EHS to be careful about the kind of water that you're drinking, so as not to trigger chemical symptoms with chlorines or a high chemical load in the water. Glass bottled, if you're drinking bottled water, it probably makes sense because of leaching of toxins through plastic. Um, and beware of either under or over hydrating. Follow a natural balance dictated probably by your own body. Overhydration can lead to hyponatremia or low sodium, which very much echoes the symptoms of EHS and will complicate the picture. Sleep. Sleep is near the end because it begins with an S, and otherwise it should be second on this list. Sleep is hugely important. And I won't bore you with the very long list of symptoms of sleep deprivation, except to say that complete sleep deprivation leads to death in a fairly short space of time. That's all we really need to know. Um, but the symptoms of sleep deprivation, again, are identical almost to those involved with EHS. And this can, in terms of maintenance of EHS, this can be a very important one. EHS causes disrupted sleep. And disrupted sleep lowers the threshold exactly like it does with seizure seizure threshold, um, it lowers the threshold for EHS symptoms, so you can end up in a positive feedback cycle that it is essential to break for management of EHS. And I have huge amounts of advice on sleep optimization, but there's some here in, in your handout. One thing that's very important, I think, is light. People with EHS can often be a little bit um, phobic, almost, of blue light, especially late in the day, bright white blue light. And this is instinctive but very, very important. That is, their body telling them they, they, it's an unnatural exposure at that time of day. And that frequency of light turns off melatonin production like a light switch, particularly if it happens in the night when you're trying to produce melatonin. So um, sleep in a perfectly dark, dark environment and don't expose yourself to that kind of frequency of light late in the evening. Sunlight is equally important and particularly good, uh, healthy, U natural UV light in the morning to trigger your circadian rhythm and synchronize it. And of course, vitamin D production. Professor Bell Palmer has found that vi vitamin D deficiency is very common in EHS. Um, it probably is common in the general population too, especially in England in the winter. But uh, getting natural sunlight um, production of vitamin 3, I would certainly advocate. 
Sauna, I won't dwell on except to say that for people with severe AHS, it makes sense to use a non-EMF sauna no EMF at all. And the way that you can achieve this, even if the sauna has built-in EMF, is to get it very hot and then switch everything off before the EHS person gets in. So they derive the benefit of the heat, but without the EMF. Only after those A to H's are finished, I think you should move on. And I, I would like to just pause and stress that, because that is their basic, safe, easy techniques that in many cases I've seen are completely 100% successful and reversal symptoms. If those fail and they've been optimized to their best, then do move on. Nutritional supplements, again, Dr. Munro will talk to you in more detail about that. Immunotherapy um, is also one of her specialist areas. Um, and these are things that are in heart, really designed to enhance the immune system and build resilience. Autogenous lymphocytic factor, or ALF, is something that uh, Dr. William Ray in the States uses to boost immune function and, and correct some of the T4, T8 cell imbalances that he's seeing. Chelation, we'll, we'll talk about. We've mentioned the rest, apart from mold and radon gas. A home assessment of EMF is very, very sensible, either with your own meters or with hard meters. Um, but mold and radon gas can give very similar set type of symptoms and potentially trigger, and especially in the case of radon, EMF sensitivity. Um, pharmacology, I'm going to mention right at the end. Um, just be a little careful with supplements. They may need adjusting for weight. Um, they may induce sensitivity, um, mobilize mercury in certain cases, and uh, beware of the time of day they're taken in terms of um, fitting with your circadian rhythm and inter interactions with other supplements or with medication that you're prescribed. Chelation is from the Greek meaning crab's claw. There are a variety of substances that do this. They bind to toxins in the body and help uh, excrete those toxins. But they tend to bind to more than one thing at a time. So they, you, you need to be cautious of depleting useful minerals at the same time. Um, I would personally advise testing, um, either testing for this, the presence of the substance or provocation testing to ensure that you're trying to get rid of a substance that you do actually have an overload of, rather than randomly chelating. Immunotherapy, I, I will leave to experts who practice that. Um, and there are a very, very, very long list of other adjunctive um, types of management which have been advocated. I've put in, in bold a few that I happen to personally be very interested in um, and I think show serious promise for the future. It depends really whether you're looking at this from who, who is broken, the person or the environment. And my philosophy is very much that the environment is is where the breakage exists in general. But many people cannot move outside of that broken environment. And in that situation, they need to use anything they can, all of the resources they have available to them, to improve their health. I mentioned pharmacology. This should be a last resort, in my opinion. But um, antihistamines have been used. Again, um, there is uh, people with EHS have been found to have higher levels than average of histamine. And so, and histamine being an inflammatory mediator certainly would make sense for some of the symptoms involved. And that, so it may help for inflammatory symptoms and for sleep quality in those who have the inflammatory symptoms. SSRIs, interestingly, have been used um, to treat patients with positive iron symptoms from the desert winds very successfully. So there's an evidence-based um, approach using SSRIs for EHS. Anticonvulsants, particularly um, in those with neuropathic pain or um, twitches, tremors, or seizures. Um, vasopressors I've put near the end, um, I've mentioned that for people with po um, postural orthostatic tachycardia um, or some of the postprandial hypotensive type symptoms. And I've rushed through, I know, really fast. Um, and for those who have EHS in the audience, my huge respect. It's a very restrictive, very, very challenging condition to manage in modern day society. And it's equally challenging for the doctors who are trying to help you. And I would say have patience with them. Their training has um, taught them that the symptoms that you bring don't fit with anything in their medical textbooks. And that's hard for them to break out of that dogma. So this is, we're in the embryonic stages of this. It's probably the hardest point in history for people suffering with this. Um, but on the positive side, my experience is that even those with extremely severe symptoms, who've had those symptoms for a very long time, can be fully, fully reversed in a perfect environment, perfect for them. And um, it is influenced some, to some extent by the stage of their EHS and how long they've had them, but I've seen that possible. 
What I would say is, and this is the flip side of the coin, unfortunately, if you put those people back into the same environment that made them sick, which is usually high in EMF, plus or minus chemicals, their symptoms come back. In terms of how fast they come back, uh, it takes time. So the longer you've been well, the further you are able to push out your boundaries and live a more normal life. But it is important for long-term maintenance of remission or health, good health, that you stay in a good environment. Um, so to round that bit up, and I hope we have time for a quick discussion about research, I'll, I'll let you guide me. Um, but EHS is probably far more common than 3%, which is bandied about in the literature, probably far more common, because we see the, the, the symptoms escalate in the general population. It's physiological, although there are psychological sequelae, as there are with all medical issues. Education is urgently needed, and I am setting up a doctor's group here in the UK specifically to ta tackle this task. A lady asked earlier, what are we to do about it? Well, this is the one thing I'm trying to do about it. Well, I'm trying to do quite a few. But collecting medical professionals who have an interest and want to keep up to date with research, especially from our colleagues abroad, is very, very important. So if you are a medical doctor in the room today or watching this on video at a later date, please do contact me if you would like to be a member of that organization where we're going to attempt to um, educate ourselves at the highest level. History is still the most useful diagnostic tool right now, but there are a huge amount of others, which, some of which are extremely promising. Um, avoidance of triggers is essential to recovery, and optimizing general underlying health for resilience is of the utmost importance. And we desperately need funding for independent research. Do I have time to quickly mention research? Is that okay? Yes. Uh, you're being really, really good. How much time do you want? How much will you give me? <laughs> well, well, the, the point is, we freed up. Uh, thanks, thanks to you, Erica. We freed up some time for questions. Okay. When we go to questions, we must uh, give Michael first question because he, he missed out on questions. Yes. Yeah. So if you could have two, if you can like three, three minutes, it'll be three minutes, four minutes. Yes. Four minutes? Yes. Okay. Uh, Fire away. Time me. Go. Okay. Um, research. Alice has touched on this, um, and research so far has not been great in EHS at all, um, but. The subtleties, the non-linear nature of things, the fact that there's an initial reaction that tends to adapt and drop for a, a, a variable period of time and then slowly build back up. All of these things make research, in fairness, genuinely difficult, even for those who really want to demonstrate what's happening. And there are some principles which Alice has already mentioned, but I'll re-highlight um, in that you need to make sure somebody's well before you test them. You need to make sure you're testing them with their personal trigger frequencies. And you can, you can work that out with a questionnaire. Um, you need to try and emulate real life conditions cause, because in real life um, people are transferring data. They, a device isn't just switched on. It's, it has a far more complicated pattern of emission because it's actually transferring data from one device to another. I think it's also important to allow movement and this is something that we've worked out really during the course of a pilot test that we did. Um, when you look at animal species and how they use electromagnetic fields to their advantages, one thing that's important is, is movement of those magnetic particles within the field in order to set up the biological response. So somebody sitting perfectly still in a perfectly still field, they won't necessarily feel nearly as much as if they're moving within the field. And follow up for delay symptomatology. And I put together a, a short questionnaire and I, I screened some people for appropriateness for a, a short study that we did, a very small study. Um, you must not test people who either have symptoms too mild or too extreme for your, for your test. You don't want to put somebody in hospital. You also don't want them so resilient that they're not going to feel a fairly mild provocation. Um, and uh, we used a double-blind system where we had computer-generated fields um, and, and device-generated, computer-generated onset and offset and device-triggered fields uh, with random sequences used. We also checked... Uh, for latent effects after, and that's vaguely the test setup that we used. Um, and I won't dwell on this, but um, testing is potentially useful to allow people to demonstrate their condition. I have huge confidence in it. I know that it can work. There's already peer-reviewed published literature out there. For example, uh, McCarty Marino published in 2011 um, a, a provocation study in a VHS which showed his, his conclusion was EHS is a bona fide environmentally inducible neurological condition. So um, this will work. We just need the resources to achieve it. I really hope that's helped. Um, please do talk to me if you'd like to about the doctors group. Um, I will put a form here for people to sign up. It's not restricted to doctors, I'll just say that as well.
medical doctors are where this is aimed but anyone who has professional experience that is relevant and useful to a group like ours um, is and actually I'll just uh, this is the group that I'm setting up um, so we, we want to, to improve support for those with the HS, expand current British research um, annually share new research from each year, maintain our global academic connections and in, enhance those, um, discuss the provision of UK medical guidelines. The Austrians have guidelines. Please do go up and look those up. They're excellent. And I'm in discussions with Gerd Oberfeld, who's writing those, um, to narrow it down to things that are available to GPs. Um, and open constructive dialogue with the PHE and the Department of Health, which is of the utmost importance to moving forward. So if you're supportive of that, please do come and talk to me at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. <laughs> Michael. Michael. Uh, will you immediately come and talk to us at the British Society for Ecological Medicine about this organisation? Uh, because there's enormous overlap in our interests here. And we're also the UK Society for uh, member of the International Society of Doctors for the Environment, which is generally international, and uh, we can we can plug the plug you into that as well. Wonderful, absolutely. I mean, Rachel and I have been in some minor discussions over it, but it would be nice to formally discuss it. Yeah, that would be okay. great. Thank you. Okay, I'm sorry we have run out of time now. Um, uh, 